Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another episode in our museum's Facebook Live series. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. Due to some technical difficulties, we are pre-recording today's program, which means that unfortunately we will not be able to field your questions in real time. However, please go ahead and post them in the comment section and we will answer as many of them later as we can. Today, we mark the 77th anniversary of a revolt at the Sobibor Killing Center, where Jewish men and women held prisoner there in 1943 had the courage and audacity to rise up against their Nazi captors. As a lens into this time and place, we will share the personal photos of a man named Johann Niemann, visual evidence that documents his journey from an ordinary young man in Germany to a professional mass murderer in service of the Nazi state. I'm very pleased to be joined by my colleague, Anatole Steck. Anatole is Senior Project Director in the museum's International Archival Programs, and he worked very hard for many months to help acquire the contents of Niemann's personal holdings, his photographs and papers from colleagues in Germany. Hi there, Anatole. Hello, Edna. Good to be with you today and our viewers. It's hard to think that uh, around 10 months ago, we were still able to travel. You and I went together uh, to Berlin to meet with historians from the Bildungswerk Stanislav Hans, a German nonprofit that focuses on education and research around the killing process um, in German occupied Poland. And they worked tirelessly to explain what these photographs meant. So we are in their debt. Um, I hope you and I will have the chance to travel again soon together or just anywhere. So do I, Edna. <laughs> um, so let's help the viewers to understand a bit about the man who collected these photographs for whom these were mementos of his glory days, if you will. Who was Johann Niemann and what was the atmosphere in which he grew up? Well, Johann Niemann was born in 1913 into a peasant family in Northern Germany. He was one of nine siblings and his father made a meager living delivering milk. At 14, he leaves school and enters an apprenticeship to become a house painter. His foreman, is already an early fervent Nazi and indoctrinates his apprentices with Nazi ideology. Uh, by this time, it's important to note in the 1920s, Germany is an impoverished country with runaway inflation and high unemployment. Political violence spills out into the streets and anti-Semitism is rampant. The stage is set for someone like Adolf Hitler, self-proclaimed law and order strongman who promises to bring Germany back to its former greatness. And in the photos we just saw, we're seeing Niemann as a young man and then um, dressed in his painter's clothes um, in that job that he had. Uh, he becomes from these humble beginnings of a fervent believer in Nazi ideology and a loyal party supporter. What are some of the things that he did to show his commitment to the cause? Well, as soon as he is eligible in 1931, when he's only 18 years old, he becomes a member in the SA, the Sturmabteilung, and becomes a Nazi party member. Now, the uh, SA was Hitler's paramilitary force of thugs who were instrumental in bringing the Nazis to power through violence and political intimidation. And soon after the Nazis take over in 1933, the first concentration camps are built. In May 1934, Niemann volunteers as a guard at a local concentration camp, only 20 miles from his home, hometown. And in this photograph, you can see Niemann, the second from the right, as a guard in the Esterwegen concentration camp where, where he volunteered. Now, let's think a little bit about um, motivations, actually. We have an audience comment, a woman named Sarah watching from Decatur, Indiana, writes to say, I'll never understand this mindset. How can you go from a normal civilian to a mass murderer, especially at such a young age? Could you describe a little bit more about Niemann's rise through the Nazi ranks and what it explains about his motivations? Yes, this is a very important and uh, fundamental question. Uh, it's important to note that as far as the Nazis were concerned, Niemann checked all the boxes. He was a young fanatical believer in Nazi ideology from a very early age and was willing to do anything and all that was asked of him. He had joined the Nazi party before the Nazis rose to power in 1933. 
He had also left the church on his own account to pledge allegiance only to the Nazi state and to no other institution. And he came from a poor blue collar background and was eager for social and financial and career advancement. So soon after becoming a camp guard, Niemann makes the decision to join the SS, the so-called protective squad charged with removing and murdering those whom the Nazis deemed their political and racial enemies. And during his almost five years in the concentration camp system, he becomes gradually desensitized. He earns several promotions until in 1938, he's promoted to the staff of the commandant's office at the Sachsenhausen camp. And in this picture, you can see him in the rank of an Unterscharführer, which is basically the equivalent of a sergeant at the Sachsenhausen camp, which at the time was one of the largest concentration camps in Germany, which held mostly political prisoners. So we see that for Niemann, um, he certainly, he was a racist. He was a, you know, a full believer, a true believer in Nazi ideology, but there also were very personal, more relatable motivations, including as you've described career advancement and Sarah, keep watching um, also other factors that are um, much more base um, about material gain as well. Um, we have another audience comment. A woman named Kathleen writes that it's very frightening to me how easily human being like this man can cross the line so easily into destruction and killing, probably telling himself the whole time he was doing his patriotic duty. Um, and indeed, Kathleen, that's the thing that is actually more disturbing is to realize that these are just men and women, perhaps not unlike uh, you or not unlike me. Um, they're not monsters, they are people who become caught up in a swirl of different factors. Um, let's turn to some of those factors though, Anatole. You've described um, the trajectory of Johann Niemann through the concentration camp system, but that was not the end or even the peak of his career. What kinds of things was he willing to do on behalf of the Nazi state? Well, in November, 1939, Niemann and a small group of fellow SS guards are called to Berlin. And there they are recruited into the secret operation T4. Now this was the code name given by the Nazis to the systematic killing of people with mental and physical disabilities. And this was a turning point. Niemann becomes a so-called burner. It is now his job to drag the corpses of the victims out of the gas chambers uh, at the so-called euthanasia facilities, remove the gold teeth, and then burn their bodies. Here in this photograph, which was taken in 1940, he can be seen with two other so-called burners in the Brandenburg killing facility. And all three men by this time were considered by the Nazis killing experts, which means that they were well versed in killing a great number of people in a short time and then disposing of their bodies. And all of these three men would later advance to the death camps in occupied Poland, as in fact, many of the T4 personnel at the time did. And uh, we are again grateful to colleagues in Germany who have painstakingly identified different friends, different co-workers of Niemann in these photographs, they enable us to tell a much fuller story. The way, for example, that the systematic murder of people with mental and physical disabilities, the so-called euthanasia program, functioned as a sort of proving ground for later the mass killing, the genocide of Europe's Jews. These were men who uh, were willing they showed that they were able to normalize these behaviors and they also developed the know-how to operationalize it. So the death camps later uh, don't come out of thin air. They are kind of uh, test driven here at these euthanasia sites in greater Germany. Anatole, how did Niemann then end up at the Sobibor killing center, which is the heart of our story today? Well, your earlier comment here is very important. Niemann uh, actually showed a lot of initiative. Uh, we often hear the defense that uh, orders were, were given and orders were followed. In Niemann's case, here we see somebody who is an active participant, an active perpetrator who actually uses incentives and initiatives to implement the systematic killing of the victims. 
And you can see that in the fall of 1941, when Niemann and several fellow burners were sent to the village of Belzic in German occupied Poland. And there they helped erect the first of three killing centers system for the systematic murder of the Jews. And they use a lot of incentive and a lot of initiative to design the industrialized killing machine, which then would be used in all three death camps. During Niemann's time at Belzic, over 430,000 Jews were murdered in the 10 months of the camp's existence. And Niemann oversees the extermination area. And after less than a year and in late summer 1942, Niemann is then promoted to become deputy commandant of the Sobibor death camp. At that point, he's only 29 years old. In this photograph, you can see him posing at the arrival ramp at the death camp where the trains with the deportees with the victims would arrive. And it is a visual testament to how he as a perpetrator and mass murderer viewed himself and how he set himself the stage for himself. And Anatole, we have a number of uh, viewer comments um, showing that this theme of how someone is uh, transformed is really resonating with people. David from New York writes that this can happen in any country, that humans are humans. And Janet from Jacksonville, Florida uh, writes in to say, when you view your fellow humans as less than, then atrocities are, easily to, are easy to come by, especially if you lack being taught empathy and compassion. Um, we don't know, Janet, whether um, someone like Johann Niemann was taught empathy and compassion and his later affiliations overrode those. We just know what he did and the system of which he was a part, but it is definitely um, very, very disturbing. Now, you just showed us actually the first photograph that we've seen today that is from the Sobibor Killing Center, Anatole, um, of Niemann posing very proudly on a horse, as you said, only 29 years old and having experienced really a meteoric rise through the Nazi ranks to be deputy commandant of this um, death camp. Before the museum acquired Niemann's personal photos, we only knew of in the world, I think three, three or four uh, images of Sobibor while the facility was in operation. Give us an idea, not only of what these photos tell us about Niemann, the man, but also how they corroborate the testimony of Holocaust survivors who managed to escape? Well, many of the survivors have told us in their testimonies of the first impressions upon arrival at the Sobibor camp, and that the death camp was really set up as a place of deception. And the images in the collection bear this out. And before these images, Sobibor had been a visual void. It is now through the testimony of the survivors in connection with the images that we can see the visual evidence. And here you see, for instance, the German living quarters, which were built to resemble an orderly quaint village. Survivors often recall the little houses with tended gardens and flower boxes. And in fact, their initial relief at having arrived at such a bucolic place. Behind the German village were the prisoner barracks and the workshops. And there was in fact a small, prisoner population of a few hundred men and women at any one time inside the camp. And they were there for the sole purpose to keep the camp and the extermination machine running and for the sorting of the victim's belongings. And although Niemann's photographs do not depict the actual atrocities of mass murder that were committed inside the camp, the images contain important Holocaust evidence. So for instance, in this photograph, barely visible in the background and here inside the circle is the crane for the exhumation of the bodies from the mass graves. By the time this photograph was taken, the mass graves had already overfilled with the bodies. So they were exhumed to be then burned. And finally, on the far right of this image, you can see the train tracks uh, and the ramp, which led in the so into the so-called arrival area of the camp. I think it's um, very important that we emphasize to people also how successful and um, strategic this kind of Nazi deception was. That Sobibor, as you've said, looks like a sort of uh, benign, almost bucolic, pleasant country village. And that this was um, a way to placate, to calm arriving 
um, transports of prisoners, uh, people who were coming, old people, babies, children, um, and hopefully would breathe some kind of sigh of relief if they came out and saw this. But behind this, you see glimmers of the brutal violence that in fact is happening at what is a death factory. Um, tell us a little bit more about this arrival area, please. Well, in order to talk about the arrival area, let me also let me give our viewers a background in terms of how um, the extermination of the mass extermination system worked. So trains of 40 to 60 freight cars, each loaded with 80 to 100 people at a time, arrived at the local station. And only 20 freight cars at a time were unloaded. The rest of the victims remained behind in the locked uh, train cars. The victims were then brought into the so-called arrival area, which you can see here, where an SS man would give a speech and actually welcome the deportees to a transit or forced labor camp, promising them a shower and a meal. The victims had to undress and hand over their belongings to the slave laborers who were present as well. The victims were then herded by the German SS and their auxiliary guards through a winding camouflage barbed wire fence into the gas chambers. At least 180,000 Jews and an undetermined number of local Roma and Sinti were murdered at Sobibor during the camp's existence between May 1942 and October 1943. And just to give you an idea, the SS men would actually draw up quote unquote wish lists for items which they had the prison laborers then retrieve and search for them amongst the victims' possessions. And among the most popular items besides jewelry and gold coins, et cetera, from the victims' possessions were toys which the German SS would then bring home to their children during their frequent home furloughs. And just for clarification, when you're talking about slave laborers or prison laborers, uh, those are among the several hundred um, camp inmates who you mentioned earlier would be kept alive merely to do the dirty work to keep the, the camp functioning. Um, and Edna, also to add to that, the slave laborers themselves were part of the deception. They were ordered to be present when the deportees arrived, but they were not allowed to talk with them. And importantly, the slave laborers were not issued concentration camp uniforms, but were wearing civilian clothes, thereby making it again, look average and, and, and non-threatening. We're looking at another photograph that appears um, among Johann Niemann's uh, souvenir photos of his time at Sobibor. Explain what this basically agricultural picture really means? What's the story behind it? So the arrival area was actually a working farm. Uh, and here you can see a flock of geese, but besides being used as food and as provisions, this flock of geese also had a much more sinister role. And they're often mentioned by the survivors in their testimonies. The honking of the geese would obscure the cries of the victims as they were being herded through the so-called tube, the barbed wire fence alley into the gas chambers. Because remember, only 20 cars at a time were unloaded while the rest of the victims were still sitting at the ramp in the locked rail cars. So in order to camouflage what was going on inside the camp, the geese were used for that particular purpose. Although we're talking about this in very um, muted and matter of fact terms, this is of course extraordinarily brutal and horrific um, crimes and experiences. One of the things that is so powerful and valuable about this material is that so much of it corroborates, it um, validates and agrees with testimony that we have had for decades from survivors about the layout of the camp, about the functioning of the camp, about the role of the SS personnel and of auxiliary guards who were um, from other ethnicities, non-Germans. And here we have from a perpetrator himself, uh, photos that demonstrate that in fact, this is exactly how it happened. And now we can see it with our own two eyes. Um, what was daily life like for those like Neiman and his colleagues, uh, other members of the SS, 
who were working in Sobibor, because that's really what he was carefully curating and documenting, not the killing process. What do we see? Well, we see the degree to which the SS and the death camps, not only in Sobibor, but the other death camps as well, had an air of invincibility about, about themselves and enjoyed also a slew of privileges. There were financial and personal incentives, such as higher pay, regular home visits. Every three months, uh, the SS was allowed to go and visit their families at home for two weeks. The plunder that I mentioned earlier of the property and the assets of the victims. In the collection, we, for instance, also have the account ledgers, which clearly show that Neiman was making sizable deposits of money each time he came home, no doubt from the belongings and assets of the victims that he plundered and stole. And of course, the fact that the SS staff was spared frontline duty during the war. And in between arriving transports, the SS would idle away the time by drinking, playing cards and board games, and entertaining official guests and playing music. And you can see that in the images as well. So here you have a photograph that you could refer to as happy hour inside a death camp. This photo was taken a mere 300 yards or so from the extermination camp, or extermination area, with its mass graves, the burning pile of corpses, and the gas chambers. And if you notice, there is fine crystal sitting on the table, which again was almost certainly plundered from the victims' belongings. I think what we're, we're seeing here in really um, horrific um, focus is an ability to compartmentalize to an extreme. Not only are they compartmentalizing their socialization, here they're socializing and they're drinking and they're relaxing time. We have pictures of them playing accordions and joking around. But even when you mention the home visits and the fact that they would take toys from murdered children home to their, uh, their own families, I think it is very tempting to believe, or most people may believe, that it's almost as though these events happened not on this earth. But in fact, you know, these are men who went home every three months, as you said, slept in their own beds with their wives, played with their children, were able to do that, and then willingly return to this place where their job was the industrial scale slaughter of human beings. Um, it is a horrific juxtaposition. Um, if we could bring that photograph back up for a second, uh, the drinking photo that you just saw, um, people may also be surprised to see that there are women, uh, women not in a uniform. Um, who are these women to the best of our knowledge and what would their function have been? Well, this is again where the testimony of the survivors is crucial. According to the survivors, female local civilians from the town or from the village of Sobibor were actually employed as housekeeping staff and cooks inside the death camp. And this is a very important indication that the general surrounding population had economic incentives that were based in the camp's existence and also knew what was going on inside the camp. And in fact, there was no hiding it. With thousands of people arriving and then disappearing inside the camp, the screams and the shots that could be heard, the fires that burned the bodies day and night, the odor and then the ashes that settled for miles around the camp. So we see what are um, increasingly inclusive circles of complicity, um, whether from people who benefited or people were afraid, but that there, there was knowledge of what was happening here. This was not some kind of black hole. Um, and I think that is, that is uh, very disturbing, but also very historically important. Now we saw, for example, Neiman posing on a horse, an almost kind of pinup shot earlier. He really relished his role as deputy commandant of this place of Sobibor. What do his photos reveal about his time there that then will lead us to the prisoner revolt? So again, we see through the photographs, the perpetrator's perspective, and in this case, how Neiman viewed himself and the role that he played. And Neiman consciously, he acted out his superiority for himself, but also for the other SS men. Here he can be seen wearing a totally inappropriate gala uniform, something you would wear to a fine ball, that he had the prisoner's tailor for him. And we also have testimony of survivors who go as far as telling us that the assessment actually had their underwear 
tailored by the prisoners out of fine silk, also taken and stolen from the victim's belongings. And in fact, it was this greed and vanity on which the prisoners counted for, for the uprising and their plans to work, and then their subsequent escape from Sobibor. So tell us, this vanity, this greed, as you said, this feeling of invincibility um, offered an opening that the prisoners could exploit. How did they do that? And what happened 77 years ago today? Well, first off, a small group of prisoners who were in the know chose October 14th, 1943 for the uprising because on that day, the camp commandant and several other SS men were on furlough, leaving Niemann in charge. And they knew Niemann's weakness. Starting at four o'clock in the afternoon, a select group of prisoners summoned one SS man after another to different workshops for the fitting of fancy garments, such as a leather coat or in Niemann's case, a fine suit. All of them again stolen, taken from the victim's belongings. As each SS man entered the workshop, the prisoners then killed each one of them by using their tools, whatever they had at their disposal such as axes, hammers, and knives. And in fact, Niemann was the first of 11 SS men killed by the prisoners the day of the uprising. And as the approximately 600 prisoners, most of whom would not know what was going on until this point, assembled for evening roll call at 5 p.m. that day, the word would spread and the prisoners would then storm the main gate. We actually have um, an extraordinary piece of testimony from a survivor of Sobibor, uh, a member of the uprising, a man named Kurt Thomas, who describes uh, Johann Niemann's last moments as he witnessed them with his own eyes. Let's have a look. At four o'clock, Untersturmführer Niemann had an appointment to fit a suit. Exactly four o'clock. And as I explained before, he came on a horse. The horse's name was Tzili, a brown mare. Her name was Tzili. There were four horses, but I remember Tzili, and I think there was another one, Emil. And he gets off the horse, and right to the gate, there was also a bakery. And the baker's name was Israel. We called him Srolek the baker. And he says to the baker who looked out, baker, hold the, keep the horse. And Srulek took the horse and is holding the horse, and he walks just as slow as ever with his hand on the back and his whip and enters the, the uh, tailor shop. And as soon as he entered, they must have hit him over the head, and that was the end of Neiman. And Srulek knew that he wouldn't come out anymore, and as soon as he opened the door, he hit the horse on the rump, and the horse turned around and ran out of the yard back to its stable, wherever it was. That was the only SS man I have seen walking to his death. It's important to note that this testimony from Kurt Thomas was actually filmed in 1990, uh, some 30 years almost before the Sobibor photo albums and photographs uh, were discovered and it demonstrates the knowledge that Kurt and others in prison there had to exploit Niemann's vanity. Now we actually have photos that Niemann posed for and cherished himself, uh, showing, as you said, Anatole, him in a, a special gala kind of uniform or in other photos um, that just showed his own um, feeling of almost godlike status and how the prisoners who were there knew that. Um, so what was the end result of this incredibly bold uprising? Well, half of the approximately 600 prisoners were able to escape that day. It could have been more. However, one remaining SS man who had not shown up for his prearranged appointment and the Ukrainian guards opened fire on the prisoners. This prevented most of the prisoners from escaping through the main gate. And instead they had to escape through the minefield around the camp and to first climb over the fence and then make their way across the minefield where all many of them were killed. Here you can see the area with the fence and with the minefield outside of the perimeter of the fence on the right side of the photograph. Of the 300 
prisoners who escaped that day. Less than 60 in the end were no, are known to have survived until the end of the war. And once again, this um, truly heretofore unprecedented photograph that we had taken from a guard tower showing a sort of aerial view of the double fences uh, surrounding the perimeter of the camp uh, confirms hand-drawn maps that we had um, from survivors of what the layout of the camp was. Um, you had also mentioned Ukrainian guards. Um, these were the so-called auxiliary guards that we mentioned before, um, ethnic Ukrainians who were drafted in to um, amp up the staffing at Sobibor and other camps. And the Neiman collection, we could do a whole episode just on that, um, documents in, in much more vivid detail than we had heretofore had um, what their relationship was and how critical they were to the functioning of the camp. Um, in tribute to those uh, brave men and women, we'd like to show a photograph taken less than a year after the uprising of some of the, the people, some of the Jewish men and women who organized um, the revolt at Sobibor. Uh, who do you recognize here, Anatole, among others? Well, as you just said, this is a group portrait of survivors from the Sobibor uprising taken less than a year after their escape. And in the back row in the far right is Leib Feldhändler, one of the leaders of the uprising. And the young woman in the front row, second from the right, is Esther Raab, who later settled in Silver Spring, Maryland, not far from the Holocaust, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, and whom the museum has interviewed together with other survivors from Sobibor. And these interviews were recorded in the 1990s. And for viewers who would like to learn more, um, hear more of this firsthand testimony from Esther Robb and others, we will be posting links in the comment section um, where you can uh, dive deeper into this history and the multiplicity of perspectives that we now have. Before we close, Anatole, we have only been able to scratch the surface of what is really an extremely um, rich uh, collection of photographs, of documents, and the impact they have on our understanding of the Holocaust on the staffing and mechanisms of the killing centers, so many subjects. From your mind, having studied these for a while, what do these photos teach us more broadly? Well, as you already stated earlier, Sobibor until now was a visual void. And before the museum, thanks to the Bildungswerk Stanislav Hans, was able to acquire Niemann's photographs and personal documents earlier this year. In fact, there are over 360 photographs which document his entire Nazi career, and 62 photographs are specific to Sobibor. So what the photos tell us and what they visually confirm are the details which only the survivors and eyewitnesses could have known and which their testimony confirms. And this is retroactive validation of what has happened. And the photos contain crucial evidence against those who might seek to deny or belittle the Holocaust. And the images also confirm once more that the Holocaust would not have been possible were it not for the willing participation of ordinary individuals like Niemann, whose collection we now have. Well, Anatole, I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and giving people some insight into what is an incredibly complex but a vitally important history. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. I also want to just mention as a note, um, these are not the only materials that we have at the museum that show Nazi officials documenting their so-called glory days. And when we look at them as part of a totality of our holdings, we also understand them in a different light. So we are incredibly um, grateful and uh, feel a, a grave responsibility to be the stewards of this collection, which will continue to speak for this history when uh, there are no more eyewitnesses among us. We also pay tribute to the extraordinary bravery of the men and women who launched the prisoner uprising at Sobibor 77 years ago today, and may their memories be for a blessing. We are continually learning new information and we're always glad to share with you the ways that work like of, um, professionals like Anatole to gather and collect enhances and expands our understanding of the events of the Holocaust. It helps us to understand how vulnerable human beings are
to these kinds of forces and that the choices that we make can have long lasting implications on ourselves, on others and our society. We hope that you will join us two weeks for today, from today for our next Facebook Live program. For Disability Awareness Month, we will be having a program focusing on the Nazis' nameless victims, uh, those adults, those children who, as we discussed today, were the targets of the Nazis' first systematic mass murder program. This program for Disability Awareness Month will be held on Wednesday, October 28th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time here in the United States, and we will be um, helping to understand and restore humanity to people who through new records we are now able uh, to identify and describe with the respect that they deserve. Until then, be well, be healthy wherever you are, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.